Welcome to Topic 2, Materials Engineering Atomic Bonding, Part 2. In the last topic, we talked about how when I apply a load or force to a beam, such as a wing, you get an elastic deformation, and that elastic deformation stretches or compresses the bonds between the atoms. Well, let's look in more detail at how we measure this elastic deformation. So there's this thing called a tensile test which can tell us how much a specimen will stretch or deform under an applied tensile load. But load and deformation are geometry dependent. So for example, if I had a very fat, large cross-sectional area and I applied a force F, I'd get a small deflection. But if I had a very small cross-sectional area and applied the same load F, I'd get a much larger deflection. You can practice it at home by simply taking something large and soft and stretching it and you'll notice it deflects much less than if you took a smaller object of the same type of material. So there's this geometry dependence that we don't like to have when we talk about material properties. We only want to look at material properties that are independent of geometry. So we can eliminate this geometry dependence by using something called the engineering stress and engineering strain. Before we get into that, let's look at how we do a tensile test specifically. So in a tensile test, we have a tensile specimen, this dark gray area here, held between two grips. And those grips are slowly pulled apart by two large screws that are rotating. And what we do is we measure how far apart those grips are pulling versus the force that's required to keep pulling them apart at a steady rate. So in other words, the input to the machine is the displacement, or how much we're pulling apart the sample. The output from the machine is the force, or how hard it, the material resists being pulled apart. Well, what we then do in engineering analysis is we take that displacement and we divide it by the gauge length. The gauge length is a nominal dimension across this narrow section of the tensile specimen called the gauge. When I divide by the gauge length, I get what's called the engineering strain. We'll look more at this engineering strain in a moment. With the force, I do something similar, except that here I divide by the cross-sectional area of the sample. So the force divided by the cross-sectional area becomes the engineering stress. The equation for engineering strain is epsilon lowercase epsilon equals the change in length of the tensile specimen divided by the original gauge length of the tensile specimen. So what we've done is we've normalized the, the displacement by dividing it by a fixed constant geometrical dimension. The units you may have noticed are unitless. If I take a length and divide it by a length, I shouldn't have any units. But for some reason that makes people nervous. So you'll often see the units displayed as millimeters per millimeter or inch per inch. Or, more commonly, you'll see it listed as a percentage. So let's say, for example, I had a sample that was 100 millimeters long originally. And I, deflect, I deform it so that it stretches 10 millimeters. So 10 millimeters divided by 100 millimeters is 0.1 or 10 percent. Now that's a pretty big elastic strain. In fact, in most cases the elastic strain ranges from very small numbers up to about 0.01 for most materials. The exceptions to this are materials like plastics and rubbers which can stretch to very much, very long distances. So how do we produce strain? Well strain comes from a stress field in this case. We apply a force which we then convert to a stress, and that produces a strain in the material. Well, it turns out there's a material property called the elastic modulus, which determines how much strain you get when you apply a certain amount of stress. And we'll look at the equation that governs that relationship in a little, in a little bit. There are other ways to get strain, too. For example, I could heat the material up with a thermal field, which then expands the material, causes elastic strain through the ex thermal expansion coefficient of the material. I could also apply an electrical field and some materials will actually expand and experience strain called the piezoelectric effect. This is how speakers work. We apply an electrical field to the speaker and a small crystal expands and contracts to create the sound waves. 
We can also get some materials to expand and contract in the presence of a magnetic field. This is particularly true of magnetic fluids. And this is something called the magnetic magnetorestrictive constant that can controls the behavior between the magnetic field and the amount of strain the material experiences. Well now let's look at engineering stress in more detail. The engineering stress, or lowercase sigma, is equal to the force applied to the tensile specimen divided by A naught, where A naught is equal to the cross-sectional area of the material. The units for stress are either megapascals or PSI, pounds per square inch. Remember that a megapascal is 10 to the sixth pascals. You notice I have in parentheses here KSI, and that's because some people like to write PSI as thousands of PSI or KSI. It just saves us having to write out as many zeros. But this isn't a real unit because you're mixing um, uh, metric units with English units. There are different kinds of stress. So for example, there's tension stress, which is where I pull on this hook eye beam, or I'm sorry, this eye hook, and I get a tensile stress in the shaft of the eye hook. I could have a column which supports a load and compression, so the force is being applied downward onto the column. I can have biaxial stress, which is this balloon over here, where the stress is being applied in two directions across the surface of the balloon. I can have hydrostatic stress, where the fish experience pressures in all three directions because it's underwater. And I can have shear stress, where as I torque this wrench, or the socket, I apply a shear stress in two directions, in this direction and in this direction, and that twists the material. There are lots of different kinds of stress, but they all produce strain. Now, it turns out that strain is something we can actually measure. All you have to do is be able to measure a change in length. But the problem is there's no easy way to measure stress. So for example, we have what are called strain gauges, and these strain gauges are simply electrical wires that zigzag back and forth that get bonded onto a surface of a tensile specimen. Then I measure the electrical current running through this wire as a function of the load I apply to the material. What we notice is that the electrical resistance goes down because as you stretch the material, the resistivity goes up. We can also measure this using something called a wheat bridge, wheatstone bridge circuit, which I won't go into, but it's a series of resistors that help us to measure the change in current relative to the change in displacement that a material experiences. But none of this helps us figure out how much force is actually applied to the material. So how do we do that? Well, at the end of the day, we have to use what's called Hooke's Law. And Hooke's Law says that the stress acting on the material, sigma, is equal to the strain, lowercase epsilon, times this new property called the elastic modulus, or capital E. And this is the one-dimensional uniaxial form of Hooke's Law. If we wanted to come up with a three-dimensional Hooke's Law, we'd have to add another property called Poisson's ratio that helps us to understand how strain varies in different directions. But we won't go into that in this class. Hooke's Law only applies under very small strains, typically less than 0.002 or 0.2% strain for most materials. But it turns out that Hooke's Law still works for elastomers or rubbers up to about 0.01 strain or 1% strain. There's two kinds of deformation that we'll run into in this class, elastic deformation and plastic deformation. There's an important difference here. Elastic deformation is temporary, while plastic deformation is permanent. If you let go of the load after plastic deformation, the material is permanently changed its shape. Whereas in elastic deformation, if you release the load, it goes back to its original shape. Now, elastic deformation, if this is a stress-strain curve, so here I have strain on the x-axis and stress on the y-axis, the stress-strain curve follows a linear relationship at first, that's Hooke's Law. But then eventually, at the yield stress, it begins to go non-linear. And when it's non-linear, we have plastic deformation. When it's linear, we have elastic deformation. So Hooke's Law applies to the elastic deformation, but Hooke's Law does not apply to the plastic deformation. And that's important to keep in mind.
How do I calculate the elastic modulus of a material? Well, it's pretty easy. If I have a stress-strain diagram, all I have to do is measure the slope of that elastic portion of the curve, where it's linear. So the slope is the rise over the run, or the difference between two stress values. Remember, we have to be inside that linear part of the curve, divided by two strain values. But remember that sigma 2 and epsilon 2 can be set at 0. If I go back to the previous graph, you remember that, that when there's zero strain, there has to be zero stress. I can't be deforming the material and, and apply a load at the same time. Or in other words, if I have no load applied to the material, then there's no strain. So that means that I can simply take one point of stress and one point of strain, make these two values equal to zero, and calculate the elastic modulus. And if you work out the algebra, Stress sigma or stress equals E times epsilon and that's Hooke's law. Now it's important to remember that elastic modulus has nothing to do with how strong the material is. It's all about how stiff the material is. So low modulus materials are floppy, things like foam, rubber, and plastics. But high modulus materials are stiff, things like metals, ceramics, and composites. Stiffness is a mechanical and not really a material property and can be controlled by changing the geometry. So remember the example of the yardstick. The yardstick is floppy when I have it laying flat, but if I sit it on its edge and try to bend it, it gets much more stiff. That's mechanical stiffness. But the elastic modulus of the material has not changed. It's the same material with the same properties. It's just the geometry that's changed relative to how we're trying to bend that yardstick. There are three types of elastic behavior that we have to keep in mind. Linear elastic behavior, which is true for metals and ceramics, has a straight line. If I go up the line, I apply a load, I get a certain amount of stress and therefore a certain amount of strain determined by Hooke's law. If I let go of the load at any point, the material just responds and comes back to zero strain. But there are also nonlinear elastic materials, typically rubber, rubbers or elastomers, so that as I apply a deformation to the material, the stress initially goes up and then it flattens out and I can stretch that rubber a lot without much more effort or stress. And then eventually the, st the stress goes up dramatically when I try to get out to larger strains. So this is like the behavior of a rubber band. As I pull on the rubber band, at first it's very easy to stretch that rubber band, but eventually more strain gets more difficult and the stress goes up dramatically and, and eventually the rubber band breaks. But all of that is elastic behavior. If I were to get up to this point and let go of the um, the load on the rubber band, the strain would return to zero by following this curve. The last category of materials, elastic materials, is called anelastic behavior. In anelastic behavior, the material's stress versus strain curve follows one shape when it's being loaded upwards, but when I release the load, it follows a different shape. That creates something called a hysteresis loop. A hysteresis loop is when I have a loop between two different directions of behavior. So in be the middle of the loop is the amount of energy that's stored or, or dissipated by the material by loading it upwards and downwards. This is a little confusing, but the area underneath the stress-strain curve is equal to the energy it takes to actually deform the material. So it takes more energy to deform the material when I go up and less energy when I re return. But what happened to the extra energy? Thermodynamics says that all energy is conserved. Well, that extra energy is dissipated as heat or noise. So anelastic materials actually have the ability to absorb vibrations and turn those vibrations into heat. That's why cast iron is used for engine blocks.